Hi, welcome to our webinar. Um, my name is Robert Meppelink, um, uh, and I will introduce myself later to, uh, in the slides. Um, let me see. Um, this is a webinar from Secura about um, breach and attack simulation. Uh, and in the coming 30 minutes or so, we will explain you uh, how we as Secura approach uh, testing uh, networks using simulated attacks uh, and a way that you can assess your detection capabilities within your network, uh, which you can see as kind of a fire drill on your uh, detection capabilities. Um, so uh, this webinar is called uh, Breach and Attack Simulation. Uh, we will present in the coming 30 minutes or so uh, our approach. Afterwards, you can ask questions. You can type the questions already during the presentation. We will answer them afterwards in the question and answer section. Um, and I will read them uh, at that moment. In case there is not enough time at the end of the presentation, um, we will uh, email the answers to the questions. Um, so, um, who's who today? Uh, my name is Robert Meppelink. I'm leading the product development department within Secura. And your presenter today is Rolf Monen. He is the technical director at Secura. And um, yeah, he will take over from here. So, thanks, Robert. Be careful, one and a half meters distance. Yes. <laughs> Great. So, yeah, thanks, Robert, for the introduction. Um, as uh, Robert mentioned, uh, my name is Ralph Monen. I am technical director, aka CTO, at Secura. Um, Secura is a company that was founded in the year 2000 with uh, roots in the uh, Dutch hacker community. Um, I myself am an old school hacker, started in the 80s tinkering with um, computers um, before there was any internet. Um, and throughout my career, I've always had a very, very strong interest in, in, in security. Um, and after a short career, um, in uh, professional services at uh, Big Four, I uh, ended up as a, an entrepreneur. Um, and a couple of years ago, we um, basically, together with two companies, Madison Gurkha and ITSX, we formed Secura. Um, Secura currently has a couple of service lines. Uh, you might be aware of them. Uh, security testing being the most, uh, the, the largest of our product lines at this moment. Um, and basically it contains our offensive security services, so penetration testing, source code reviews, uh, vulnerability management, vulnerability assessments, those kinds of services. Um, and this is a quick introduction. We also do training and awareness. Uh, Robert, of course, is, par is, a, is our manager of the product development department, so we also build tools, and we also have an audit assurance and certification uh, side of things. The um, um, agenda for today um, is going to look into the backgrounds and concepts of breach and attack simulation, why you would want to do that, how we're going to do that, challenges, and then a case study, um, <clears throat> because obviously we will need to know how these things work in practice. couple of backgrounds and um, concepts then to start off with. So, first of all, as I mentioned already, that we perform uh, quite a few internal and external security testing and red teaming exercises. We don't just do that to find the vulnerabilities. It is also very much meant to uh, see if the blue team, aka the defenders, have adequate detection capabilities and to train them in detecting the attacks that we are um, uh, simulating or actually executing in that uh, in those cases. Um, and we find that many of our tax attacks, they go unnoticed. So we perform a penetration test or a red teaming exercise and the blue team um, either has very limited um, you know, feasibility on the attacks that we execute or none at all. Um, and then, of course, the question arises, 
Why? Um, because they just spent a lot of money on an intrusion detection system that provides input in the form of security events uh, to a seam. The firewall logs are also pumped into the seam. There's an intrusion prevention system, maybe. The workstations, the endpoints, they all deliver security events to the seam. And there are people watching there uh, in the SOC. And somehow, um, it still doesn't get detected. So we set out to um, find out why that is. And it turns out there are quite a few reasons. Um, <clears throat> so relevant security events might not be ingested into the seam at all. So there's, yeah, there's a limitation there. This could be due to um, storage limitations, maybe licensing limitations even in the seam, other things. It could also be that the use cases that are programmed into the SIEM are simply too simple, not accurate, or yeah, the, the product default use cases that came with the product when it was installed and uh, configured. Um, it could be that agents on endpoints are malfunctioning. There, there's quite a lot of reasons, and we'll go into those reasons in the end when we look at the case study. Um, what we actually thought of was would it be possible not to do these attacks but simulate those attacks because when we actually perform an attack it's quite timely and costly um, and although it does show you where the real vulnerabilities are um, there might be an easier way if the goal is simply to find out what the detective capabilities are and if we can do this, we could potentially structure and automate such testing of the um, detective capabilities. And at that point, it becomes even possible to make it part of an improvement cycle where you can actually test, improve, you know, a, a typical uh, denning cycle where you have a plan, do, check, act um, phases. So you could plan to see what use cases you need. You could then test to see if these use cases were actually working. If not, adjust and in that sense, make an improvement cycle. So this was an interesting uh, concept, which led us to, uh, to the concept of a security posture evolution, which means basically that um, your security posture is not something that is static. You change and adapt and this could also mean changing and adapting um, towards the actual attacks that are happening. Um, and automated testing is definitely a part of that, because how cool would it be if you could answer the question, um, am I capable of detecting this specific um, attack campaign that is coming from a threat actor somewhere in uh, in, in a former foreign country uh, happening in the financial sector uh, that started last week am i capable right now here in amsterdam on my network in detecting that specific campaign um, if you can adapt in a continuous fashion and answer that question then you're busy basically evolving your security posture. So a tool like this, or a, yeah, a mechanism in which you could continuously uh, test and adapt your detective capabilities would be very valuable. So <clears throat> that already answers the part of the question why. Um, so to recap this, Automated simulating attacks can be done frequently. So where if we do a penetration test or a red teaming exercise, uh, this is typically not something that we do frequently for one single customer. Yeah, we do them frequently, but for different customers. Um, and they're quite expensive, to be honest, because there's a lot of people hours that go into these exercises. So if you could um, somehow automate at least part of it, um, it would become much more cost effective. 
Also, it validates your SOC SIEM use cases, um, not only if you have a SOC SIEM in-house, but also if you have uh, outsourced that to a SOC SIEM MSSP. Obviously, as a last point, it definitely does provide the blue team with more training. Um, however, of course, over time, the blue team will definitely know <laughs> that these what these attacks are being simulated. And in some cases, of course, you want the blue team to be in on it. So it's not just a question of um, running these simulating attacks and seeing if the blue team reacts. It is much more a case of testing the SOC SIEM implementation. Right, so how do we do it? Um, well, there's a couple of ways you could do it. So let's see. Um, <clears throat> first of all, it would be very good if we uh, could break an attack down into individual steps. And the individual steps of an attack uh, could then be simulated. Um, and it turns out that actually that's already been done. So if you take a look at the MITRE attack framework, um, which I highly suggest that you do, you will find there that um, each step in an attack has been broken down into little tactics, techniques, and procedures, the TTPs that um, adversaries use in their attacks, and they're strung together into a complete attack. And this goes down into quite a, a level of detail. Um, so if you actually go to the uh, MITRE website <clears throat> that deals with the attack framework, you will be able to see there uh, all kinds of um, individual steps in attacks from initial access through execution, persistence, privilege, escalation, etc. And then per phase in an attack, so let's pick the, well, the execution, you have there, well, um, execution through module load which is a specific technique that can be used. Um, a scheduled task, of course, if you um, have a Windows system or a Linux system or any system actually, you usually can schedule tasks. And one of the ways that attackers can gain access is to modify the list of um, scheduled tasks so that they can inject a malicious task and gain entry into your systems that way. So these things, these, these little TTPs, um, and if you go through the list, you'll see quite a few that you recognize, of course, um, from um, all the types of um, techniques that malware use to other threat actors, um, from credential harvesting to brute forcing to buffer overflows, um, web application type attacks, they're all in here. Um, so that's already quite a bit of the pre-work done, actually. If you want to simulate an attack, you can string complete attacks together from these TTPs in the um, MITRE attack framework. So now we know each and every little step. Um, how can we actually simulate that? Well, to simulate them, Let's have a look at where do the security events actually come from. And usually these are security events that come from sensors on the network. They come from endpoint detection and response suites. They come from the Windows event logs, Windows security logs, um, firewall logs, could be switch logs. But these are all log files and messages that are coming from agents or sensors that are placed somewhere in the network. Um, so if you actually look at how to simulate that, actually what you're doing is you're de-weaponizing the actual attack. And you don't do the attack, but you only leave the traces. So let's, for instance, say one of the TTPs is brute forcing. Well the traces that a brute force attack leaves would be a whole bunch of failed login attempts, which will be visible in a Windows event log or a Windows security log. So that's one way. 
Um, obviously, there are also some network-based attacks that you wouldn't really want to do live either, but you can use them uh, also, except you do them with non-production systems, right? So instead of actually sending an exploit packet to the domain controller, you could send it to a specially set up sensor in the system. Um, and that would then also be registered as a real uh, event. So there are ways of faking the traces that are left by an actual attack. Well, what are those traces? Could be network packets with a certain signature that can then be picked up by the IDS IPS. It could be IOCs, so in indicators of compromise that are hit. These are you know, known IP addresses of uh, malicious actors, usually command and control servers, but it could also be domains where malware is hosted. And we know these domains, so we could fake, for instance, that a workstation goes to one of these domains. Um, yeah, another pretty common one is a process that is spawned from another process. This happens mainly, for instance, when a uh, Word document or any other Office document is opened uh, with a macro inside, then the trace that would be left is that the word.exe actually spawns another process, for instance, a PowerShell.exe. Well, if that happens, you know something is wrong, but these things, they leave traces. This will leave a log entry in the Windows event log that word.x has spawned this process. So these things can be faked because um, it is actually possible, it turns out, to generate these Windows events without actually having the event happen. So you can create a fake log entry. And the same goes for when you actually open a file, you read a file, you open a network connection, all these events can be faked. Um, some things you would have to do really, such as uh, modifying a registry entry, but you can do this on a system that is enrolled in the SIEM uh, and has an agent on it. Um, so, Again, all the things that you actually would do, you would do then on a non-production system, but it's still possible to fake that. Um, and you can go as far as to actually inject an attack signature in RAM, in, in the memory of a system, so that the agent on a system would be able to read that out and also see that a event is happening there. So these are all methods of faking the traces of an actual attack. Um, so to recap, instead of ingesting the firewall events, antivirus events, all these other events, we inject fake events. And the fake events are designed, in this case, to trigger the use cases of the SIM. So the SIM is an actual appliance or a piece of software that is usually programmed to detect certain events um, or combinations of events, I should say. Um, so a use case could be in the scene, I want to be alerted whenever someone logs into my VPN coming from an IP address in China, for instance. This usually doesn't happen, huh? um, so I want to know this. So if we want to fake that event and see if we can trigger the alert from the scene, we would have to fake log entries from someone logging in to the VPN from an IP address from China. We don't have to do it, we just have to create those fake log events. The SIEM will obviously uh, fall for this little trick um, due to the fact actually that there is no encryption and authentication on most of the log gathering and collection protocols um, that are used. So we can fake these things without the SIEM noticing in most cases. Um, in the end, of course, there is an interaction with a human who takes a look at these things and does triage and says, hey, this is an actual event or it is a false positive. 
we're not looking at that point at this uh, uh, at that process now, but it does become relevant in a minute. Um, so in the end, we thought up of a system where we would have um, uh, several machines. Um, one machine that we chose to be a Linux engine that would be able to send out network traffic, for instance, hit an IOC, or it would be able to send a fake syslog message and a Windows target with an agent on it uh, for those cases where you have an agent based an EDR suite or some other agent based monitoring system that sends events to your SOCSIM solution. And you'd be able then to generate all kinds of events, including events like spawning processes from Word.exe or changing registry entries or whatever. So we built this um, to see if it was actually possible as a proof of concept to uh, make these fake events happen. Of course, there are some challenges. Um, just before I continue, Robert, how long do I still have? You're good on time. I'm good on time. Excellent. Really good. Um, so we have some challenges, obviously. Um, so adversaries, they, they combine all these little TTPs into their scenarios. Um, and sometimes it's not clear from the start which exact TTPs they would be using for example, when they do lateral movement or when they exfiltrate data, because especially if you look at the more sophisticated threat actors, they are continually evolving also. Um, so you do need really good insight into the current TTPs that threat actors are using. Um, and that requires, to be honest, um, a uh, you know a, a good information feed, good CTI, uh, cyber threat intel, and we were looking into ways of gaining that. And of course, someone else thought of that already. And there is a um, a protocol called Stix, which is the uh, Security Threat Intel Exchange Protocol. Basically, um, it's a data format that describes these TTPs exactly. So um, we have not implemented any of that yet, but for the future, we see it very possible to ingest the TTPs described in this STIX exchange format into some kind of framework like our uh, system that we built and using that as a real-time feed to create the exact attack scenarios, fake them, and then answer the question, can we actually see these things? So the, the, the path to the future also is pretty clear. Yes, in the future, we will be able to answer that question. Um, can we today detect that um, scenario from the campaign, from the Russian or the Chinese or the whatever threat actor it is, doesn't matter. Um, and can we detect that now? So the last challenge, of course, is um, how do we know when it was detected? And there's a couple of ways. In the ways that we've done it until now, we actually sit together with the blue team when we do these attack simulations and we can see, we can see the alerts coming in from, the, uh, from their seam. Um, Initially, we thought it would be possible to completely automate this um, and use an API, for instance, in the seam to correlate the alerts to the events that we sent out, the, the fake uh, log files, the low fake log entries that we sent out, and basically match them to the alerts and say, hey, we just sent out this thing, I can see this alert coming in. But it really turns out that that did not work in the cases that we looked at. And the reason for that was that often there is a quite a large lag in time between the generation of the fake log entries and the generation of the alert. This can have quite a few reasons. Most of them are, the, for instance, a certain threshold has to be reached before the alert is generated. 
but the most common reason is actually that there are intermediate log file aggregators that only send through their log files every say 30 minutes or sometimes even every hour so we send out the fake logs but the alert is only generated an hour later so yeah then it becomes very very difficult to correlate that alert back to the events that we sent out if it was a more immediate thing then that would be possible but in the most infrastructures it's not an immediate thing log files are collected somewhere when they serve, reach a certain size or a machine maybe if it's an endpoint is reconnected back into the network it sends off its log files this could even be a day later so the time lag is a thing here so we found out that it was much much easier to actually um, uh, sit together with the blue team and run through their use cases one by one um, so yeah, I've pretty much answered it. Can we do it? Yeah, we can do it. Um, there's also a collection of open source scripts that I want to point your attention to called Caldera. <clears throat> it does it partially. Um, Caldera currently in its current state, I believe, uh, can do quite a few network-based replay attacks. So they send out network signatures. So for network-based intrusion detection uh, testing, that is fine. <clears throat> I don't believe they actually currently do any of the host-based uh, uh, detection and Windows event log faking and syslog faking, but whoever knows. Um, we didn't wait for that, of course, so we started building our own implementation of, the, uh, of this. Uh, we called it Purple Box because it's basically a blue team and a red team in a sort of box. Um, and we've noticed that also another handful of companies are moving into this space of uh, breach and attack simulation also. So it's it, the whole concept of simulating attacks and breaches to detect your or to test your detective capabilities is becoming a new part, a new branch, I would say, on the uh, tree of information security companies uh, and, yeah, and testing companies. Um, so you could envision it a bit like this, um, where you have a couple of threat spaces. In this case, it would be something to do maybe with Chinese state proxies. We have run 47% uh, of the attacks, of which 30% was detected. And we can actually then tell exactly how many of these TTPs were detected and map them back immediately to the MITRE attack framework, which would give you an overview, a really you know, a good breakdown of the uh, detective capabilities of your SOC SIM solution. Um, this is a mock-up. This is not the actual software. Um, it's something you know, that I think it could look like in the future. Um, with this, I'm going to hand over the presentation to Robert now, because um, obviously we tried to do this at our customers, and we did with success. And Robert will talk you through a case study now, um, showing you how we did that. Yes, thank you, Rolf. So um, this case study um, is something that I executed with my team at a customer in the financial domain. Um, it is a customer that used a, uh, a big, widely known commercial SIM solution, and they had implemented 200-ish uh, uh, use cases. Um, and basically, they uh, came to us because they noticed that some of their use cases actually never triggered. So they would never end up in their report. And for a few of those, they would expect that because they were incidents that would be highly unlikely but other events well they would have guessed that that would happen once in a while and it didn't so they asked us to test this uh, so what we did is we uh, selected hundreds of their use cases and we um yeah we implemented them in our simulated platform so we simulated events um, and we executed them one by one together with their blue team. So we were sat in a, in, in a room together. At that time, that was still a possibility. And um, we ran those use cases. And initi the initial parsing of, um, of these messages, of these events, 
uh, even failed in 20% of the cases. So uh, the SIM didn't even understand the, uh, the message coming in. Uh, moreover, if we, uh, after that was adjusted uh, in their SIM, we figured out that uh, in most of the cases where they would expect an alert, no alert was being raised. And uh, the reason behind that uh, was that the rule was not implemented correctly. Uh, these rules, um, have a little background in, in how such a SIEM works, um, you need to map fields like the source IP address, the destination IP address, the host name, uh, I, uh, no, uh, all kind of information that you need to use to correlate whether an event is, um, is, is a dangerous event or is just a normal event. And it depends per message source, whether it's the firewall or a Linux system or a Windows event system, it, it differs from each system how these fields are called. So if you use the wrong field name, the use case would never trigger. Um, and that's what we figured out, that in more than half of the use cases that we, um, that we tested, there was no trigger, there was no alarm, even though they would have expected it. Uh, the nice thing about this solution uh, and sitting together with the blue team was that we could immediately trigger and re-trigger and re-trigger the same use case and also fix what was actually not working at that moment. So uh, within an hour most in most of the cases, we could fig figure out what was wrong, fix it, and verify that the trigger now was being raised and that there was an alarm being raised. So um, that uh, was in this case, uh, 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 the most important thing. Uh, at the beginning, uh, most of the use cases uh, did not work. And when we uh, ended it, it uh, did work. And it showed that simulation of events actually uh, helps doing such, a, uh, such an assessment. Um, and with that, we uh, come to the end of this uh, presentation and webinar. Um, now it's time for the question and answer section. Um, Ralph will answer the questions and I will uh, read them. If you still have questions, you can type them in the question box and I will uh, read out a few of them and uh, let um, Ralph answer them. Thank you, Robert. <clears throat> so the first question, um, how would you assess the response readiness at the customer? Do you validate the design of their governance processes, techniques, plans, resources, et cetera, to react on incidents? Um, that is typically not a part of this technical assessment that we are talking about here. If we were to look at response readiness in a more holistic way, then definitely we would also look at these points such as governance, um, but moreover, very much also the, uh, the knowledge of the people who are actually doing the detection, so the blue team members, yeah, how, uh, how well are they first in threat hunting, how well do they do triage, how well do the teams, because typically in a very large organization you will have multiple teams, not just one blue team, there will be the network team, there will be the endpoint team, there might be the web front end team, and you will also need to assess how these teams communicate and how uh, events are correlated between that. Um, the, the, the biggest issue that we found, and this maybe is, is, is just good to mention, is that the visibility on your network, your servers and your endpoints is usually not as good as you think it is um, for the reasons that Robert, uh, Robert mentioned. So when looking at response readiness, it is definitely um, uh, not just a question of testing these use cases. Um, that's one big part of it, but it's also these other parts. Okay, thanks for the answer. Another question that came in. Um, is a check of a SIEM part of a standard IT audit? <laughs> um, as far as I know, there is no standard IT audit. Uh, a good auditor, of course, will ask. Um, do you do anything in terms of monitoring and uh, analysis of events? Um, but um, as far as I know, an actual test of the detective capabilities is not 
the standard part of any IT audit framework that I know of. Okay, thank you. Um, then a question on, um, uh, let me see, uh, can you tell something about the duration of the testing of a SOC SIEM solution? What kind of investment are we talking about on average? Ah, yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> so, if we uh, if we do this engagement with a customer, we'll typically sit down with the blue team for a couple of days with a couple of people. Um, so you're looking at uh, at an in investment of um, you know anywhere from 10 to 20 man days, um, and in that time we will be able to run through an X number of use cases. Of course, if you scale that down, you can test three or four use cases in a few days, no problem. If you scale it up. And you want to do 100 use cases of course that would be a lot bigger effort um, but yeah th think in terms of you know anywhere between 10 20 30 man days maybe yeah okay thanks um, then a question that is about um, the attacks themselves do the attacks vary depending on the system or you just simulate attacks that are the same for every system ah Good, good question. Um, now, some attacks are the same for any system, as long as it's Windows, for instance, because the Windows event logs are pretty well defined. They have numbers, and we can fake those quite easily. What we did discover, however, is when it comes to firewalls, routers, endpoint uh, detection and response suites, and others, all their log messages vary wildly um, and the only uh, standard that they adhere to is a syslog and there are even multiple syslog standards so even there they are not the same so to simulate for instance uh, an attack where a certain uh, event is generated in a, a juniper firewall that will create a different log message than from a Cisco firewall or a Palo Alto next generation firewall or any other product. So each product has its own message format. And to simulate it, we need to know these message formats. They are all different. Clear. Thank you. Um, how to do these simulations in an environment that cannot be isolated from the network, neither stopped? Um, well, um, in a system, well, the thing is, we are testing it on a network, on a production environment. So we do need to send out these fake messages in a production environment on a running network that cannot be stopped. So how to do it? Well, as we described, we just do it. Correct. We introduce a new system, right? Yeah, we introduce a new system into that environment. If Okay, if that is a problem, then there might be other ways of getting around that, but we will have to inject um, fake messages in some way. Yes. And next question. How do you define use cases in a SOC SIEM? Can the MITRE ATT&CK framework be used for that? Um, it can, yeah. It does depend uh, on your exact team, whether you can get into the nitty gritty details of it or if it's just more a of a black box type of solution. Uh, we do see more and more products where you as a as a as a configurator don't have a lot of say in these you know the, the small details, but mm -hmm. um, in the cases where we have been able to uh, dig deeper, um, you, yes, you can relate them directly to the TTPs from the MITRE ATT&CK framework, that is not a problem. Um, and what's more, there are a lot of online resources that actually do this. If you take a look at the MITRE ATT&CK uh, pages at the main website at MITRE, um, you will see that they have done this for a part already. Um, and then there are other tools and resources that you can use to build your use cases on based on MITRE ATT&CK framework. I believe the, I can't remember the name of the product, but there is a uh, an open source product that the NSA actually built um, that you can use for this. And you can even fill in your sticks information and everything and correlate that and make the, your use cases based on MITRE. 
I, I remember you have to Google it. I, I forget the uh, the actual name of the product, but it's made by the NSA um, and it's open source. Um, a question um, on um, yeah, on socks basically. Uh, how can we, as a small uh, payment organization of five people, um, uh, find a, find a sock or uh, connect to a sock? How you can connect to a SOC? Well, I presume you are talking about a, an MSSP, so a security services provider that provides SOC services. Of course, um, well-known uh, companies that do that in the Netherlands are, for instance, KPN and Fox and Northwave. So basically what you'll have to do is make sure they ingest your security events. There's two ways of doing that. They can place a network sensor in your network um, or you can send your filtered or unfiltered event feed to them using a secure tunnel or VPN or some other means. But you, you will have to get your events in some way to them over the internet usually, um, but that's how you connect to them. Clear. A question regarding the use case study. Are the use cases tested during implementation? Um, yes, uh, let me answer that. Yep. Um, yeah, the, the use cases themselves are tested in the sense that we uh, try to trigger them. Um, we do not check whether uh, the use cases themselves are complete, so whether the, uh, there would be a gap in the use cases. So we, in this assessment, we took the use cases as is and then verified if the use case themselves is correctly parsed out, triggered, and uh, yeah, uh, caused the correct alarm. Yeah, and during implementation of the SIEM, if you have a new use case in your SIEM, we find that most customers do not test them at that point. And if they do, uh, also the quality goes down over time because all kinds of things change. So it could be that an application upgrade uh, happens and the format of the log file changes but the parser is not reconfigured so it doesn't parse the syslog messages correctly and therefore no alerts happen anymore so it can be that the use cases are tested during implementation of the seam and of the use case but then after a while it doesn't work anymore and you will never find out if you don't test it again using similar techniques as we do yes um uh a question, um, is it correct that your main message seemed to be if you don't test your SIEM system well, it provides you a fake feeling of security? Uh, yes, that is, a, that is very well uh, concisely put. Fire drills are also done for a reason. Um, they are done so that you know that your emergency procedures and your detection mechanisms and your response works. Um, and yeah, it's always been a bit of a, you know, a mystery to me why we didn't have that same approach in cybersecurity. Okay. Um, if I look in my window, I see that we... Ah, uh, I see a new question coming in. Great. Uh, what if the head of security wanted to test his blue team response? How will you manage that since the blue team can't be alerted? Um, I, I would not use this technique to test the blue team because um, we would be testing specific use cases and not looking at the actual response that the blue team has in terms of maybe blocking our simulated attacks, um, uh, you know, um, doing threat hunting on the network and on the log files that are that are there. Um, if you want to actually test the response of the blue team at that time, then you would actually have to do those attacks uh, in real life and adapt as you notice that you are being detected. And the correct tool to do that is a red teaming exercise. Correct. Although during our uh, our case study, mm -hmm. um, uh, we did notice on the first day when hardly any uh, use case triggered. Uh, basically, we were there in peace and quiet in in a room. Yeah. And on the second day, uh, 
the people of the SOC came running in uh, both uh, virtually and in real life. Uh, we hope this is you because uh, there are a lot of strange things happening. So yeah, 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 we, yeah. We did see a response in the blue team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this would be this would not be the best way to test Correct. the actual response. Correct. Um, let me see. I see that we answered the questions uh, and we run out of time. If there are any other questions, please feel free to contact us. There is a link in this uh, webinar invite or by uh, reaching out to your uh, contact person at Secura. Uh, we thank you uh, very much for attending today and uh, we wish you all a great uh, remainder of this day. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.